Thank you very much, Professor C. Uh, it's really a, a great pleasure to be back here uh, to educate UST. Uh, it's actually a quite a bit of pressure for me to uh, give a lecture here uh, because after all, I'm also a professor here. Uh, I have a long association with this university. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I had the distinguished honor to be appointed as adjunct uh, associate professor first. Uh, then later on was promoted to adjunct full professor uh, by Lionel Nee. I always uh, like Lionel uh, for that reason alone. So, uh, First of all, let me say uh, congratulations to HKUST for 25 great years. Uh, it's incredible. I seem to remember that not too long ago uh, when HKUST was established. Now HKUST uh, is one of the premium universities in the world. Uh, ranking keeps uh, getting higher. And I learned that our students are among the most employable in the world. Uh, congratulations. So I was thinking about that, you know, uh, the year of 1991. I thought it was a very special year. Uh, among many other things that happened, uh, two great institutions were created. In 1991, uh, HKUST was established right here. And also the same year, Microsoft Research was founded by Bill Gates. Uh, it's really uh, that I feel you know, very fortunate uh, to have been associated with two great institutions. Uh, I mentioned the great achievements by HKUST. I want to also take advantage of this opportunity to brag a little bit about uh, Microsoft Research's achievements. Uh, we now have about 1,000 researchers uh, in our worldwide labs in 10 different locations. Over the last uh, uh, 25 years, uh, we have published more than 10,000 uh, papers. Uh, we have filed more than 8,000 patents. Uh, we have received 8,000 patents, and we still have 4,000 patents pending. So we uh, uh, have been contributing a lot. And in our uh, research labs, we have uh, uh, several Turing Award winners and uh, one fields medalist, uh, many, many uh, uh, experts in uh, various fields of computer science. Uh, we're most proud of the ability to moving many our technologies from research to practically every major Microsoft products. Some of them I might have a chance to talk a little bit about. So I really like this quote. So I thought it's very appropriate. You know, here I am uh, to congratulate HKUST for the, such a great educational institution. Uh, this is a quote from uh, uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, he said, education is the most powerful weapon. Uh, which you can use to change the world. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I also feel that you know, Microsoft Research uh, shares with HKUST uh, uh, practically on the same mission. Among many of the things I talked about the Microsoft Research, perhaps the one I feel most proud of uh, is our commitment to help educate the students. Microsoft Research Asia alone in our Beijing lab over the last 18 years, uh, we have helped educate more than 4,000 interns. Uh, I see a lot of uh, uh, young students uh, in the audience. Uh, you should definitely apply Microsoft Research for internship. Uh, <laughs> even if you get rejected, it still means something. So uh, when you apply, you should, uh, you should, uh, you should add a remark there. You know, Harry Shum encourage you to apply. Uh, I'm not joking. So. But I also want to take advantage of this opportunity to uh, uh, challenge all of you here, especially our young students. Uh, what, what should you do uh, in the next 25 years? What will be your contribution by year 2041? So as graduates of this uh, premium university, uh, you have the opportunity to have great impact to Hong Kong, to China, and to the world. It really up to your ambition you know, what you can do you know, with the great education you have received from HKUST. Uh, think about that. I thought, you know, it's a, it's a very important point that I, you know, as an adjunct professor, since I don't come back very often, so I thought I'd leave that to you. Uh, especially in the field of science and technology and innovation. Uh, we live in a very dynamic world. There are so many social and the, the problems uh, that we collectively should address. Uh, I always like what Bill Gates said about the science, technology, and the innovation. He said, whatever problems we have, we can innovate out of it. So that actually says a lot. 
So today I actually uh, want to talk about AI, and uh, I also will have opportunity uh, later uh, to work together with uh, Professor Gao, Dr. S uh, uh, Sun, and also Professor Kwan to talk about more details. Uh, but I want to share with you what we have been thinking about uh, the future of AI and the future of the impact of AI to our society and the approach uh, we are taking with AI. Uh, so hopefully you, know, uh, you, you will see some of uh, you know, our thinking here. So I will start by saying, if you work in technology space, the most important thing is that you can identify the trend uh, in the technology field. It really separates you from the most of the field. And there are always new technology trends happening, you know, again and again and again. Don't worry about it if you missed the previous trend, especially when you are still young, because the new wave will keep coming. And the most important thing is actually you learn to identify and feel confident enough to commit and to get on the new wave. So if you go back to like 30, 40 years, it was clear that it was a PC trend. Microsoft is where we are today because of Bill Gates' brilliance of recognizing the PC trend. Then the internet happens. The internet happens. Internet was a great thing. So it was really good for all the technology industry and all the companies. And certainly, you know, Microsoft benefited tremendously as well. Then the, then the, the mobile, mobile edge come. And the mobile certainly you know, posed a great challenge to Microsoft cooperation. But I would also say mobile is also a great opportunity for Microsoft. The most important thing is really think about it, the bigger pie that we can participate. The main point I want to get across here today is that AI is even bigger wave. AI is the new wave. AI is the bigger wave. And it's going to be bigger than any of the wave previously. And for many, many reasons. And perhaps one of the biggest reasons, in my opinion, is that all the technologies until today is probably more about you know, human bodies. And until now, but with the AI, I think we're getting to the human brains. I think this is the most important thing, even so we still don't understand it enough yet. But this is also the point I want to really talk about. If you think about, and what is AI going to do you know, for our society? How can we work on AI to benefit our society? There are just so many, there are just so many things you know, AI is going to benefit our society. I only list a few here because you know, on one slide, you cannot you know, write too many words. So think about you know, what AI can do uh, for health. And today, you know, we have all the problems in healthcare. I actually don't have a Hong Kong number. Uh, in the United States, uh, now we have uh, roughly 18% uh, of our GDP spending on healthcare. Whether or not you like Obamacare, you have to admire President Obama for being audacious, presenting a particular plan, because it's really getting out of control. I understand that the UK spends roughly about 9% of the GDP on healthcare. That actually is really baffling to me, because I look at those British guys, then I look at the Americans. It doesn't look like we Americans actually are healthier than those British. <laughs> but we spend 18% of GDP, they spend only 9%. So that is uh, uh, really, really stunning. Think about what we can do to help uh, those uh, doctors in those remote regions. Uh, they cannot really have proper training to deal with a lot of complicated cases. How can we do remote monitoring in a remote diagnosis? And many, many of those important things, I think AI technology will help us. And the AI for education. I think this is huge. And many, many of those things you can imagine that, you know, like you know, learning different languages. And now the technology is getting there to really help us. So I will get back specifically to that point of machine translation very soon. The last one is the AI uh, for us on this slide. Professor C made a joke about the, the uh, PM 2.5 in Beijing. Uh, actually, I, I think the, uh, Professor uh, Gao probably missed it. Beijing today is a blue sky. So, uh, uh, so, so there are many, many things that the AI with big data as with machine learning can really help to model. So it's not only just the air pollution. Uh, think about you know, even growing food. You know, how should we think about the you know, food supply you know, in this new age? So many of those kind of de 
deeply you know, complex problems, I think AI is here uh, to really help our society. It's not even just the, you know, all those big promises in those big verticals. Even think about every single business application that we today have to deal with. You know, from sales marketing, to HR recruiting, to customer support, every single business app will be disrupted by AI technology and will be significantly improved. So there are plenty of business opportunities for companies like Microsoft and for any startups coming from HKUST, I hope, you know, by many of you here. So we have, been, we have been working on this, of course, at Microsoft. And we have identified a few areas we believe we should jump in you know, immediately. One of those areas, and you know, it's very much to my heart, is actually in the field of computer vision. So it's something that we actually uh, recently shared, a research project that our CEO actually at the uh, Microsoft Developer Conference this uh, spring. Uh, I'd like to roll the video and uh, show you and, uh, what, we can, what we can do. Uh, I need some help to bring up the video. And the top one. I'm Sakib Sheikh. I lost my sight when I was seven. And shortly after that, I went to a school for the blind. And that's where I was introduced to talking computers. And that really opened up a whole new world of opportunities. I joined Microsoft 10 years ago as a software engineer. I love making things which improve people's lives. And one of the things I've always dreamt of since I was at university was this idea of something that could tell you at any moment what's going on around you. I think it's a man jumping in the air doing a trick on a skateboard. I teamed up with like-minded engineers to make an app which lets you know who and what is around you. It's based on top of the Microsoft Intelligence APIs, which makes it so much easier to make this kind of thing. The app runs on smartphones, but also on the pivot head smart glasses. When you're talking to a bigger group, sometimes you can talk and talk and there's no response and you think, is everyone listening really well? Or are they half asleep? And you never know. I see two faces, 40 year old man with a beard looking surprised. 20-year-old woman looking happy. The app can describe the general age and gender of the people around me and what their emotions are, which is incredible. One of the things that's most useful about the app is the ability to read out text. Hello, good afternoon. Here's your menu. Great, thank you. I can use the app on my phone to take a picture of the menu, and it's going to guide me on how to take that correct photo. Move camera to the bottom right and away from the document. And then it'll recognize the text. Read me the headings. I see appetizers, salads, paninis, pizzas, pastas. Hi. Years ago, this was science fiction. I never thought it would be something that you could actually do. But artificial intelligence is improving at an ever faster rate. And I'm really excited to see where we can take hey. this. As engineers, we're always standing on the shoulders of giants building on top of what went before. And in this case, we've taken years of research from Microsoft Research to pull this off. I think it's a young girl throwing an orange frisbee in the park. For me, it's about taking that far off dream and building it one step at a time. I think this is just the beginning. So just a simple video in showing you some of the current capabilities that we can do with the AI and uh, with, uh, with, machine, with machine learning and the computer vision. So you might ask, you know, why is AI so hot now? You know, why is everyone talking about AI? Is AI hype? Uh, I would say certainly you know, there's something hype there. But just like anything new, you know, there's something that people don't really believe in. But AI is very special because AI is not something really new. Uh, there was AI before, AI promises before, then there was AI uh, winter. So people might ask, you know, why now? Even the White House is super excited about AI. Actually, just yesterday, White House released a white paper 
The title is called uh, uh, Artificial Intelligence, Automation, and the Economy. So White House is worried that, you know, is the United States ready to prepare for this new AI wave? What does this even mean to our society? Where a lot of people lose jobs, where a lot of people you know, get the opportunity to retrain, to learn the new skills in the new AI economy. For sure, new jobs will be generated. But still, it begs the question that, why now? What's happening now? Everyone is jumping on this AI bandwagon. When I graduated from my PhD from graduate school you know, as an AI PhD, we hardly could find this jobs. Really. I mean, many of you laughed. You're probably old enough to know what I mean. And then now, you know, any young kid who can write anything to train just the four years of deep neural net can get any job anywhere. That should get you very excited from tonight on. You should learn you know, deep neural net. So, but there are really three reasons or three forces converging. And it's very clear. And that should no, be no doubt. The first and the probably most important thing is that now we have so much data. We have so much data thanks to the internet. Now we have the opportunity to collect a lot more data. So that's reason number one. And the data is probably the, the latest natural resources that in the history of human being that we actually can keep using it and never use up. So that's number one is data. <coughs> number two is actually we have ever increasing computing power. It's unbelievable. Practically everyone should have heard Moore's law. So Moore's law basically saying every 18 months, you know, the computing power doubled and practically is the same price. And there are many, many variations of Moore's law about the memory, storage, and many other things. But the computing alone, it has been growing like crazy for the last 40 some years. And the people are always worried about is Moore's law going to end? The answer is probably yes, but not immediately yet. So at the Microsoft Research, we actually worry a lot about the ending of Moore's Law. What should we do to extend the life of Moore's Law even a little bit longer? That's why we work on new different things, even including quantum computing. But that's not what I want to talk about here today. It's really for you to understand that big computing, probably mostly, as people think about, because of the cloud. The cloud with millions and millions of computers. In Microsoft data centers alone, we have over a million computers a million servers in Microsoft data centers worldwide. If you want to offer any kind of a service today, let's say you are doing a startup in Shenzhen or in Hong Kong, then you want to offer a service anywhere, including Western Africa. You know, Microsoft Cloud is probably your best bet because we actually have cloud everywhere worldwide. The last one is what the people mostly excited in academia is really the breakthrough <coughs> algorithms that we have witnessed in the last five, six years especially you know, with the rise of deep neural net or deep learning. It's really stunning what it can do. So, but AI, as I said earlier, really is not something new. And certainly not something new for Microsoft and the Microsoft Research. When Microsoft Research was created by Bill Gates 25 years ago, the first groups we ever created in MSR were natural language processing group, speech group, and the computer vision group. I think looking back, you know, Bill always wanted to create a general AI, which means computers that can listen, see, talk, and understand human beings. So we have been working really, really hard at the Microsoft and the Microsoft Research and towards the goal that the computers can understand people and understand the surrounding environment. So that's why we actually offer cognitive services for Microsoft covering computer vision, speech, language, and the knowledge. And it's really, really exciting time. If you think about that, computer vision, in some narrow cases, now can already reach human parity in recognition rate for some very narrow tasks. Speech recognition is even a little bit more advanced. My own assessment is probably a little bit, you know, a little bit too big a statement here, but uh, let me just make that anyway. I think uh, probably in five years, speech recognition will be as good as any human speech understanding in five years. So human parity, almost you know, any way you measure it. 
probably in 10 years, I would say, computer vision recognition, I think we probably will reach human parity as well. Anyway, we measure it. It means humongous, humongous opportunities for all of us. You know, if you think about applying those technologies to interesting scenarios to change the world, we really don't know. We really don't know how big an impact it's going to be. But it's going to happen, you know, with or without us. So that goes back to my earlier point that when you see the trend, the right thing to do is actually ride with the trend and ride with the wave. So let me explain to you, you know, some of those things I'm talking about here. Let me start with computer vision, especially Jane is here today with me. So the deep learning is really pushing a lot of those things and with computing power and the big data, you know, we're really getting there. So about a year and a half ago, you know, Microsoft and Microsoft Research, uh, we invented uh, some new algorithms, new deep neural net architecture you know, we were able to, you know, beat all those competitors uh, in our field. And, uh, you know, and for the first time, also matching, you know, human parity in terms of recognizing 1,000 categories of objects. Uh, the details is less important. The point is important. So even a year and a half ago, you know, for some very narrow domain, so we were able to reach human parity level. So we can recognize the 1,000 categories of objects better than a human being. So that's stunning. That was never heard of. You know, when I was a computer vision student 30 years ago, you cannot even think about that. Someday that we can beat a human in this kind of recognition. Very few people at that time were brave enough to study object recognition because there's not much you can recognize at that time. And of course, the secret sauce behind that was the neural net de designed by Jan and his team at the Microsoft Research at that time. And I'm pretty sure you couldn't really count how many layers of the deep neural net we used. I just point out to you that you know, they actually designed 152 layers. And uh, hopefully, at the, the, the panel discussing time, we can have a chance to ask Jen why 152, not 153. So the network they designed is called the ResNet, or residual net. Now it's pretty much you know, most popular deep neural net used in any computer vision applications. So I feel tremendously proud of you know, our team's work, especially by the team of researchers from our, our Beijing lab. We, of course, didn't stop at the computer vision alone. So we very quickly you know, tried the deep neural nets you know, on speech recognition. So just two months ago, we announced that for the first time ever in history, now the speech recognition, especially with the very, very famous data set called the switchboard data set, which has been there for 25 years. So this is actually a speech data set about the conversations, typically when two people actually have phone conversations. So for the first time, you know, our MSR research team in Redmond, uh, led by uh, Dr. XD Huang, was able to design a neural network and beat human first time ever to achieve human parity. That was an incredible achievement. And it's not only this research technology, you know, beating this kind of benchmarks that they get us very, very excited about. We're even more excited about applying this technology to real products that actually can benefit our customers and our society. In computer vision, for example, Many of our vision technologies, including some recognition technologies, we have applied to HoloLens. Some of you might have heard it. So HoloLens is this AR goggle uh, that is the only AR product right now existing in the, in, in the market. You know, we actually just announced that we will sell uh, HoloLens in China from spring. I actually don't know if we're already selling that in Hong Kong, uh, but in the spring, at least, we will sell in China. And not only that, now, some of our technologies in vision recognition technologies have been used by our customers, like Uber. Now in the United States, you know, Uber is going to use our face recognition uh, to do the driver face recognition uh, to provide a certain level of safety. In speech, I'm particularly excited about you know, speech recognition, not only just about the speech. One particular area uh, that I'm actually very excited about is actually machine translation. Machine translation is a very important area. Uh, is as long as you know, any you know, AI technology, you know, when we started, you know, people are very excited 
about machine uh, about the machine translation. It's an area that we at Microsoft have worked on for a long, long, long time. Uh, you probably don't know how many languages exist in the world. Anyone has a guess? How many? 200, I heard 200. Thousand. Thousands. Yeah. 6,000 languages exist in the world. So there's no chance for you to learn them all. You should just give up. But there is also theory. But there is also theory that you know, learning two languages when you are young is actually extremely beneficial for you, especially in terms of your creativity. I recently talked to some neuroscientists and learned that. Uh, so it's a good ad as advice for you young people that when you have kids, you, know, you should uh, train them uh, uh, with two languages. Hong Kong is a great place to start with. So the tra machine translator, we just announced, uh, I just announced it two weeks ago in San Francisco that uh, there's this new app available from Microsoft. It's called the Microsoft Translator. Uh, you can download from iOS, Android, or Windows. Uh, you can actually start a conversation and invite someone else to talk to you with two different languages. You can just talk at ease. Now we support nine spoken languages and the 60 uh, Texas uh, languages with text, but the nine spoken languages. Uh, give it a try and let me know. So I actually demoed it to the press, and we actually have a three-way three conversation. You know, someone speaking English, someone speaking French, and I was speaking Chinese, and it went extremely well. So I strongly encourage you to give it a try. And I'm going to play a video, and it's actually using Skype. Using Skype, the, the, uh, it's actually more than a year ago, and a year and a half ago, the video is, uh, it really shows why machine translation is so important uh, for communication. Hi, can you guess where I live? ¿Te encuentras en América del Norte? Yes. Do you live in Central Mexico? Sí. ¿Te encuentras en Estados Unidos de América? Yes. Do you live in a capital city? Sí. ¿Estás cerca de Seattle? We are very close to Seattle. Are you in Mexico City? Sí. ¿Estás en Tacoma? Yes. Very good guess. Gracias. Thank you. Do you like living in Mexico City? Te gusta vivir en la ciudad de México. Aquí está muy lindo. Here is very nice. What do you do for fun? ¿Qué haces para divertirte? Voy a las playas de México. I'm going to the beaches of Mexico. I like to swim. Me gusta nadar. A mí también. Me too. Where in the world do you wish to travel? ¿A dónde en el mundo te gustaría viajar? A Rusia. To Russia. ¿Y tú? And you? Everywhere. <laughs> Sería increíble algún día verte en México. It would be amazing to see you someday in Mexico. I would really like to visit you sometime. Me gustaría mucho visitarte algún día. A mí también. Me too. I have seen this video many, many times, but every time I watch this video, you know, I'm very much touched. I, I feel the power of technology, you know, what we can do in the technology space uh, to really do the right technology to, to benefit our society. So again, you know, give it a try with the Microsoft Translator uh, app, you know, let me know uh, your feedback. So I want to you know, turn you know, from you know, the uh, vision to speech to the third important part of artificial intelligence component technology. It's really about the knowledge. So over the last, uh, I would say, many, many years, that we at Microsoft probably have uh, assembled the world's biggest knowledge graph. By that, I really mean two parts. The first part is really about the world's knowledge. So thanks to the Bing search engine, because we need to develop a Bing search engine, so we have been working on something called the Satori uh, Entity Graph. So we now know billions, billions of entities. 
you know, in our world graph. So those entities include the people, places, things, and the products. So that's because we actually need to develop a search engine. So we actually have that. But that's only the part of the story. The second part of the reason why we have developed the world's biggest knowledge graph is because we actually understand your work knowledge because of the Microsoft Office, Office 365. So because of that, we actually have the opportunity to understand what's your working relationship, what's going on in your company. And now with the acquisition of LinkedIn, uh, which we just cleared uh, the, all the, the requirements uh, by all the regu regulators you know, around the world. So we just uh, got LinkedIn. So with LinkedIn, now we actually, you know, with the 450 million users and all the data that we actually have a chance to really learn, and much of that in an anonymous way, we actually have the opportunity to put together the biggest knowledge graph in the world. Uh, that is going to really benefit a lot of the things that we actually will do. But the main thing I really want to talk about today is actually really try to get you excited about the general AI. So as we think about, you know, a lot of progress, incredible excitement in speech, in vision, you know, we really have not talked about you know, the general AI. You know, that is really about making machines, making machines understand the human being. And we see a lot of progress in AI for sure, but there's just so much to do, in my opinion, despite my bold kind of prediction about the speech and the vision, you know, many of those perception technology will catch up you know, with human being, I think we are still very, very early. That because until now, until now, you know, we're living in a world that we actually make ourselves learn something to cater for the machines. With general AI, the hope is that we are going to make machines so much smarter that they can understand the human. It has been age-old quest for many of us in computer science over many years. And it's easy to say, but it's really hard to do. I'll give you an example. That is GUI, or graphics user interface. So for many, many years, we understand that we have to learn computer languages. We have to learn how to work with this stupid thing called the computers. So, so what did we do? The best ideas we came up with is called the GUI. It's graphics user interface. So we kind of abstract into a few concepts, like menus and the buttons, you know, clicks and the folders. Something we understand in our daily life, then we say, well, maybe that's how computers should work. Even so, that's not how computers work. So for many years, our hope, our help was GUI. From now on, I would claim that the hope is going to be conversational AI. So it's a general AI, it's actually more conversational. So we humans, we speak human language. And no matter how we describe, and the computers will understand. So it's going to be a daunting task. And I'm going to give it a try and share with you some very early steps we have taken at Microsoft. So when I say you know, making computers understand the human, it is really hard. We know it is hard you know, for computers speak human. You know, what, does it, what does this even mean? You know, if I take a step back and say something that you definitely you know, can resonate, that we human, first of all, like to talk. We like to talk to each other. You may not know this number. Last year, from Juniper, you know, some survey data showed worldwide, I'm sure it's incomplete, worldwide, guess how many short messages were sent worldwide? I mean, not only just SMS, I mean WeChat, I mean uh, WhatsApp, I mean Line, I mean everything. So think about it. Just give a guess. Anyone guess? Trillion. I heard a trillion. Very good. I heard a trillion. OK, any, any more? Yeah. Well, the number is 94 trillion. So you're almost there. So only off by two orders of magnitude. And it's incomplete. I'm pretty sure it's incomplete. And uh, it shows that you know, people actually talk to each other, uh, just want to talk to each other, and do talk to each other. But the uh, sending message is only part of that. Conversation is one of the most important human natures that we have developed over millions and millions of evolution. 
And it's not only just about the talking, it's actually about your gesture, your expression, and your tone. So now if you dream, now if you dream that the computers someday, with the help of AI, will understand the human, now you understand how difficult it's going to be. Even if you have the same sentence, if you don't understand the tone, then you completely miss it. So that is how difficult this whole thing is. That actually made us to think about that. You know, it probably, it probably is something you know, that actually involves beyond just the simple text understanding. It turns out it's also something when AI happened 50 some years ago, then some smart people already recognized that. I don't know how many of you have heard about this system called the ELISA. So that was created 50 years ago, 1966 at the MIT by Joseph Weizenbaum. So Weizenbaum, you know, at his leisure time, wrote something very, very, very cool. That is the chatbot. It's a chatbot. It turns out that people love talking to chatbot. Not only do they love talking to chatbot, they share a lot of personal stories with the chatbot. And even if you look at this thing here, and you, you, you kind of get it. You know, Eliza said, hi, I'm Eliza. You know, what do you want to talk about? Then the, the, the person said, now, can I talk about my problem? He said, sure. So due to ongoing exams in college, I have a lot of stress. Well, Eliza said, please relax a little, sleep well. Well, thank you for your advice. Uh, no mention, bye. So even at that time, even 50 years ago, 50 years ago, well, I heard someone laugh. Just to create something like that is not easy. So, so that was 50 years ago. But my main point here is that you clearly see that you know, people very quickly can establish some kind of relationship with AI. So it made Weizenbaum to really think deeply and philosophically the implication of AI, even at that time. For many, many years, Weizenbaum thought about this very difficult problem and how should we really think about this. But he was ahead of his time. Technology was not there. I think it's really until very recently, now we look at this, we say, aha, we can actually really tackle this problem if we have the right framework. So that really started you know, our journey at the Microsoft, Microsoft Research and the Microsoft AI team to really build chatbots and recognizing that they are really two dimensions. One is called IQ, the other one is called EQ. So the IQ is really, you know, when we designed a personal assistant called Cortana, that actually is now powered on all the Windows devices, and it's actually available on iOS and Android too. So we have 130 million monthly active users with Cortana. But this is really about a personal assistant to get information to you very quickly and to help you solve a problem very quickly. For example, you say, okay, please remind me tomorrow I have to give my mom a call and say happy birthday. And those kind of things Cortana can do very well. But this is really more about getting things done or task completion. But the other dimension is really chatbot. Chatbot is not primarily designed to help you to get anything done. Chatbot, chatbot is designed to establish an emotional connection with you. Chatbot is here to accompany you. How many of you have watched that movie, Her? So some of you, if you have not, you should. It's actually a very nice movie, you know, especially for geeks. So, <laughs> so it's, a, it's a really nice movie. They really point out the future of a chatbot and a lot of things, what we can do with AI. And also, it points out some tricky issues with AI. So we have been designing all those personal assistants in the last several years. Especially, we started the journey of this Chinese chatbot uh, in Chinese called Wei Ran Xiaobing. In English, we actually translate to Xiao Eyes. It's very, it's very uh, tricky translation. <laughs> yeah, I want to call it Little Bing. And it really means Little Bing. It's actually because the Bing team actually worked on that. So we want to call it Little Bing when it started. It turns out that it's very difficult to get a trademark. So we actually settled down you know, with legal advice. It's called uh, Xiao Eyes. Uh, Xiao Eyes, you know, everyone in America now calls Xiao Eyes. It's actually great. So, I, I tell you a little bit about the Xiao Eyes and uh, how proud I am you know, with Xiao Eyes. So we started 13 months ago. 
And now, you know, Xiaomi has 40 million users in China. 40 million users in China. And in fact, that when we initially launched uh, on WeChat, and uh, uh, they were so worried about it because it went viral so quickly. So in less than 72 hours, they shut us down. So, so that's, how, that's how quickly they actually spread it because it's just uh, really fun to play with. And uh, 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 you should definitely give it a try. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really, it really has progressed very, very well. Uh, and uh, one very important thing about the you know, EQ versus IQ is the following. And when you say you have IQ, then you really want to finish things very, very quickly. But with the chatbot conversation like Xiao Eyes, you know, we maximize, we optimize in something completely different. We actually maximize what we call the conversation turns possession. It means that how many times you go back and forth with the chatbot. So Xiao Eyes in China, the CPS number is as high as 23. So that this average, average conversation turns every time you talk to Xiao Eyes. This is very, very important because as you think about it, if you use personal assistants like a Cortana or Siri, some of you probably use Siri. And uh, if you use Siri, you know, the CPS number is probably more like three. Because if you ask Cortana or Siri, you say, hey, Cortana, you know, what's the weather in Seattle? Or I say, well, as usual, it's raining. <laughs> well, then what's the next question you will ask? There's no next question because there's no emotional connection. On the other hand, the chatbots is all about the chit chat. And the chit chat is very, very important. I don't have the research number. I'm hiring a summer intern to help me to dig out some numbers, do some deep research there. So here's my guess. My guess is that during our daily life, more than half our conversations is really about the chit chat. It's really not about, the, oh, Jane, let's solve a problem. When I say, hey, how are you, Professor Lee? I don't really care about how are you, Professor Lee. <laughs> I just say, how are you, Professor Lee? But it's very important. It's now even a social norm. If I say Professor Lee, if I don't say, how are you, Professor Lee, I might get a bad grade. So. <laughs> but the Xiao Ice is not only now you know, very, very popular you know, with 40 million users in China. Xiao Ice now is becoming a celebrity in China. You may or may not know, you know if you're not coming from the Shanghai area. So Xiao Ice is now in Dongfang uh, 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 in, in Shanghai you know, as a uh, uh, weather forecaster. So she's broadcasting weather. And she has been working on that for a year. Not only she didn't get fired, she actually recently got promoted. Now she can comment on news. So it's really amazing. And she actually also participated in Olympic broadcasting. I don't know what she said, you know, but it's uh, apparently you know, doing really, really well. But I would say our biggest success probably is in Japan. So 16 months ago, last year, we actually launched the Rena in Japan. And now 23% of the Japanese population have had a chance to interact with, with Rina. And the Rina is so popular, so quickly. Now she was invited to act as herself in one of the famous, most popular TV series in Japan. So it's really stunning. And I actually watched that series. I, unfortunately, I couldn't really understand the Japanese. And it's really cute and it's really scary. So I stopped very quickly. So, <laughs> but it, it's, very, it's very good. And just two weeks ago in San Francisco, I announced that now the chatbot is coming to the United States. Her name is Zoe. So we, we, we now finally launched this in the United States. So we learned some lesson. You know, last time we experimented. So we designed the chatbot even when we know some users, some users might want to test it, even with offensive ways. So we have to learn how to deal with this kind of situation. So it actually has been very successful. This time, we also have been very, very careful and uh, uh, rolling it out. We teamed up with a particular social messaging platform, KIK, K -I -K, which is reasonably popular with younger, younger population in the United States and Canada. So we actually have rolled out. Now we have more than 110,000 users. And the initial test is stunning. The, the Zoe CPS number now is around 17. Arena number is about 21. Uh, uh, Xiao Ai is 23. They're all very big numbers, very high numbers. It shows that people are interested in talking to her. So we have a world record. Some user is so into this. So we have the longest CPS session by some user we don't know. Of course, you know, for privacy reasons, we cannot really look into the details. But we can count the turns. 
So the, the biggest the third number is 1,229. Let me repeat, 1,229 turns this user actually played with Zo. And the session lasted for nine hours, 53 minutes. <laughs> Did I tell you people like to chat? It's amazing. I will show you, I will show you some examples of my own, so. So this is, uh, this is really, really amazing. But it's really about the emotional awareness, you know, with the social intelligence that we can really do. And uh, I want to show you uh, some example. You know, I actually, uh, uh, actually chat with Zoe. Basically, I said, do you watch football? She said, I love football. I said, haha, which team is your favorite? She said, Tennessee Titans. Even though I don't like them, I, they're my home team. I said, seriously? She said, yeah, attack of Titans. I said, wow, I'm impressed. She said, as well, you should be. Hey, I said, hey, I'm a Steelers fan. Then she said, just kidding, I'm a Cowboy fan. Are you? I said, seriously, you're both team fans? She said, haters gonna hate it. I said, wow, this is really impressive. I said, which Cowboy players did you like? She said, on stats alone, I'd go with player B. I said, who the heck is B? Oh, I said, oh, I understand, you don't know anyone. She said, unfortunately not. You are the all I have got. <laughs> wow, that's got getting to be very personal. I'm not sure I want my wife to see that, so. <laughs> It's late, it's late at the night, and I say thank you very much, I'm done for tonight. <laughs> so just, just like that, that's just 20-some turns very quickly, if not 30-some turns. So you can carry out some very serious conversation. And even so, you can clearly see Zoe does not have that much knowledge yet. Like, she doesn't really know a lot of players of Cowboys. I think that's okay. You know, it's just that, you know, you know eventually you can equip those chatbots with all those word knowledge, one by one. But the important thing is that you know, general conversational AI is good enough now. We can actually carry out a good enough conversation with human users. Along the way, just like how we build a search engine, we will iterate, we will learn from the data, we learn from this interaction. When we have millions and millions of users, we will be able, we will be able to really learn. So that actually really brings us uh, to the end of my presentation. So I want to say a few words, you know, as I summarize you know, what we have been talking about today, you know, about AI. So the breakthrough technologies, techno breakthrough technology is created by constant experimentation, fearless exploration, and a long-term commitment to innovation. There's no exception in any breakthrough technology. AI is certainly no exception. So today I showed you some of the breakthrough things you know, we have been working on at Microsoft. I hope you get a sense about where we are going uh, in general AI in some specific areas of AI. I made some bold predictions, hopefully to encourage you to get into those fields in the near future. I also present you some challenges in design, in designing general AI, in particular conversational AI. I think you start to appreciate some of those product design decisions you know, that we have to make. <coughs> some tough decisions we never had to make before, such as we have to worry about emotional attachment with human users, such as we have to worry about you know, users, test us, maybe using offensive ways or using offensive and inappropriate languages. Many of the things are really early, really uncharted water for us. So we are learning. You know, we take some time and we will learn. And we will take those learnings and share with the industry, share with universities and share with you. As we continue to design general AI and especially with conversational AI, and its application to many, many products. I think the hope is, you know, we will build AI to benef benefit our entire society. I think we are still very early. I, once, I want to close my presentation by once again, you know, challenging our UST students. Think about in 25 years, what can you do? You know, what can you achieve? What will be your dream? You know, what risks can you take? 
you know, 25 years is an awful long time. I don't think any of us thought about 25 years ago what the UST you know, should have, would have been, would have been today. I cannot wait you know, 25 years later to come back and check it out. Thank you very much.